You are listening to Scribble Talk, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and with my co-host, Ashley Hayes, we will be sitting down with industry veterans to share their stories, discuss their career and learn how to make an impact in the industry. Today's guest is Tony Birch. Tony is chairman of Shipley Limited, an industry veteran with 40 plus years experience who has trained over 10,000 people, helped win over $30 billion in new business. Elected as an APMP fellow in 2006, Tony served on the main board of the APMP for four years. During that time, he oversaw the development and launch of APMP certification program. As one of the founders of APMP UK, Tony's mission is to ensure that the role of bidder proposal manager is recognized throughout the world as a profession and not just a job. Welcome, Tony, to Scribble Talk. My personal experience of knowing you, Tony, you have one of the biggest heart in the industry and in sharing your knowledge, encouraging, your ta- encouraging new talents and new entrants to industry. Great to have you with us, Tony. Well, thank you very much for that set of kind words and nice to meet you both. Thank you, Tony. So let's, let's review back, Tony, uh, about your life and career. So where were you born, Tony? I was born just south of Heathrow in the UK in a town called Ashford, Middlesex, not to be confused with Ashford, Kent. And in 1957, so I'm 62 years old as we speak. <laughs> so how about your high school and education, Tony? Well, that aren't you there? Um, I, well, my schooling was all around the local area. I, I finished up at uh, what today is Hampton School. It was when I was there, it was Hampton Grammar School. I passed my 11 plus. Um, I decided um, when I finished school not to go to university. Um, I was a bit more interested in earning money than I was in getting further educated. <laughs> so I began working in 1975 for EMI. And famous for its records, but actually it was an engineering arm of EMI. Um, and uh, they put me through a whole series of diplomas and business management courses. Uh, so I've got lots of potential letters I could put after my name, but I never do because I don't think they mean anything today. Right. Um, right. So from EMI, how did you move into the proposal world, Tony? Um, I stayed with them in, for a long time. Um, 17 years, I think it was. At the time I left, they were Thorny MI, mm-hmm. just about to become Raycall and now Talus. Um, I joined what at that time was a company called Cap, uh, which has gone through many changes, a software company, um, and they are now Atos. Um, mm-hmm. But as uh, working in um, Cap became SEMA almost immediately as I joined it, working in that company, I was assigned to support a joint venture operation they had with what was then Western Helicopters Mm -hmm. in Yeovil in Somerset, and that's why I moved down to that part of the world. Um, And in that capacity, uh, as uh, someone there looking at commercial and sales, I um, did lots of bidding, uh, or my team did lots of bidding, as did I. And I first came across Shipley uh, in that role in the late 1980s. Right. In fact, Larry Newman was the first person I met from Shipley, I believe. Wow. He's the author of the Shipley Guides, and he trained me. He was a trainer much more in those days. Right, Tony. I mean, like, it's amazing. You know, when, when we think you as a veteran, you had... <laughs> That's amazing. Tony, tell me the three things, Tony, that not many people know of you. Oh, I don't even know three things I don't know about me. Um that's a really good question, Bhaskar. Let me think about it. <laughs> um, this is trouble with me. I'm very open. Everything about me to know, most people know. Uh, I was a private pilot. Not a lot of people know that. I, I, many years, I flew gliders and I f- had my own light aircraft uh, and used to enjoy that. Um, Oh, I did 25 years of amateur dramatics. Mm. I got interested in that as a young person. And uh, in fact, I only stopped when I moved down to the West Country because I couldn't find a, uh, an, <clears throat> an amateur dramatics group down there that I wanted to join. But uh, I've 
as a subset of that one, probably the third one, I've dressed up more as a woman than lots of other people because I used to love being the dame in pantomime. <laughs> well, Tony, this is, this is so good, Tony. I'm definitely, it's, I don't think many people know about this. Tony's unbelievable. Thank you, Tony. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So, Tony, when did you join Shipley? I joined Shipley in 1994 um, from the joint venture that I was working in. Um, I was approached, actually, by Steve Shipley, having been a customer of Shipley at that time for some four or five years, <clears throat> and actually worked with my team to apply what we were taught rather than just listen to it. Actually, I was very massive fan of what Shipley said and did. Um, so much so that I was forever giving them referrals and that caused Steve Shipley himself to fly over to the UK, take me out to dinner and at the end of the dinner he offered me a job basically to work as part of the American organization, Ship Associates. So I joined them in 1994. Um, that company changed in its way, shape and form for a couple of years and became part of Franklin Covey. Uh, then in 97, Shipley was reformed and I took the opportunity at that time to set up Shipley Limited in the UK. So on the 30th of August, 1997, Shipley Limited was born. Oh, wow. So it sounds like your role has evolved, especially taking Shipley to a global brand. Uh yeah, people, I guess people um, tend to think that I run Shipley. Uh, <laughs> I, I run Shipley's UK operation, um, not the whole brand, but I have been um, instrumental in taking Shipley, I guess, across Europe, into the Middle East and into India. Uh, there are other shipping operations that are based out in Asia Pacific and so forth. But um, Shipley Limited started working in these various places, and now there are other shipping companies in those particular geographies. So there's a bunch of them in Europe uh, and India and so forth. Oh, wow. Sounds like it's grown a lot. It meant a lot of air miles. <laughs> um, can you briefly share the history behind the Shipley process? Um, one of the things I liked uh, when I first came across Shipley is it isn't anything that someone has sat in a darkened room and thought it up and uh, then tried to impose it upon industry. What Shipley and a number of other companies um, are good at uh, collectively is observing best practice and then documenting that best practice in a form that's usable by others. Um, and that's what Shipley's done. All it's done, I say all, all it's done <laughs> is work with some of the best people in the world and like all consultants, steal their ideas, claim they're our own and sell them on to other people. Um, but Shipley kept it simple. And that was what I liked about Shipley when I first came across them. There was nothing in the first training I received that really surprised me. Um, it was common sense and practical, but we didn't do it. And mm. it's achieving that culture change in an organization. So many organizations still today have good practices, processes, procedures. They're well written, well documented, but nobody follows them. Um, and yet, isn't it funny, those that do follow good procedures and processes you know, they tend to win more business. Mm -hmm. So That's... Shipley just documented stuff. And uh, you know, don't want to go into tons of the history of Shipley, but it not only did business, this is the part of Shipley that survived today is what used to be part of it called business development services. They also had a part that helped with scientific writing, a part that helped with standard business communications, a part that helped with environmental applications within the US. So good writing, good communicating was at the core of what Shipley does. And then everything else has sort of grown from there. 
Yeah, Shipley is so well known and so many processes are kind of built off of what Shipley had the uh, forethought to document. Yeah, and uh, Shipley's culture and has always been to share, not to hold this stuff close to our chest. Um, That's great. Um, so what's your most memorable proposal or capture effort? Oh, I've got so many to choose from. Um, probably one of the funniest ones to work on was for a travel firm. This was a while ago now. Um, this firm approached us as Shipley and said, uh, can you come and help us write a bid? We don't know. We know a lot about travel, but we don't know a lot about bidding. And they wanted to bid quite a large contract for corporate travel for a, an organization. And uh, myself and my first business partner, a gentleman named David Sutherland, both went to their offices and sat down and said, OK, what would you like us to do? And you know, give us a briefing on what you do and so forth. She said, now, just read the request for proposal and uh, answer it how you think you'd want it answered if you were them. And we said, but what about what you actually do? She said, no, we'll change what we do. <laughs> so the pair of us actually got freedom to write the spec for what a perfect corporate travel organization would do. And uh, the lady that ran this company submitted the bid and she won. Uh, and we just said, good luck with delivering that. Um, oh my goodness. But she was absolutely genuine. She, she hadn't really looked at what well, she had almost no understanding of how to win in a bidding situation. And we, we weren't stretching the truth. We weren't going too far, but um, it was that she had no re reusable material. She didn't have the time to answer our questions. Um, so we got to write what we thought the customer would want to read, which was really fun. Absolutely. That's like an ideal situation, right? Yeah, no constraints upon you. Yeah. Even the laws of physics and time don't apply. You know? <laughs> Wow, Tony. Uh, from Shipley, Tony, uh, when did you join APMP to support them? Uh, I believe I joined APMP in 1996 or 1997. I think it was 96. I haven't looked back, but I was told at the time that I was the second ever international member of APMP. So I was the second person outside of the US to okay. join the association. Uh, so a long, long time ago. Right. So what was the first conference that you attended, Tony? Oh, that would have been shortly after then. Again, I'd have to look it up. But first memorable conference, and I've spoken about this many times, was um, going to Colorado Springs when uh, I think the chapter conference, not the chapter conference, the global conference, we only had some 200 and something people at the conference. Uh the association at the time was probably 600 and something members. Um, and it was announced on the first morning that we'd be going up into the mountains for a barbecue dinner. And I just thought this is going to be dreadful. <laughs> the thought of people standing there with little barbecue grills. Um, but of course, not everyone went to dinner. There was 150 of us, let's say, went to dinner up in the mountains at sunset in Colorado. Um, and we got off the coaches, had a drink, and we were all served our dinner within about 20 minutes. It was the most impressive feat of catering I've seen in my life. And what a great way to sit at the end of a conference day, halfway up a mountain, watching the sun go down. Wow, oh, Tony, that looks mesmerizing, actually. Uh, so uh... It was good. <laughs> So from then, Tony, uh, how did the UK chapter came along, Tony, and your role at uh, So the UK APMP chapter formally took off in 2001. The very first meeting uh, was on 9-11-2001, so I'll never forget that day. Mm -hmm. And there was a group of us that met in uh, Peter Cole's office at the time he worked for whatever they were called at that time, Schlumpere Semmer, I think, um, in Birmingham. And the first meeting 
was small enough that all of us could meet in his physical office and he didn't have a big office. So there was a small group of us that um, sat there and uh, started, I guess, the UK APMP. There were a number of calls probably and sub meetings that went on before then. Um, but some people wanted to set up a competing organization to APMP uh, in the sense that they didn't see why we should be aligned to a US operation. Mm. But uh, I think we did the right thing in the end in, in building onto something that was already established. Um, and the UK APMP chapter has gone on to be, after some shaky starts, you know, a phenomenal driver in uh, the association globally. 100% Tony, you know, um, yes, whatever that is, it's few people like you who just sowed the seed for whatever the growth that we currently see here. So from the conference as a member to Shipley to UK chapter, Tony, at what point um, you started to take global roles as the wider APMP board uh, role and other things, Tony? Um, well, I was one of the people that consistently as a Brit was going to the US conferences. Um, so I was very interested in the, the bigger association and uh, it must have been around the time we were starting the UK chapter or shortly after. Um, I was talking with a number of people, including uh, my then business partner, David Sutherland, um, about certification programs and the APMP had at one of the conferences I'd been to in the 1990s, someone had stood up and talked about certification uh, as being a possibility and it had never happened. And I wanted it to happen. Mm -hmm. I wanted the people in the association to feel that they were part of a profession, not just joining a club. Um, and so I began to develop a certification program. We met some immediate resistance from some established people in the organization who were saying, well, we can't certify people because if we certify them and then they do a bad job, someone will sue the APMP, um, which is a reasonable point, I guess. I found, got rid of that barrier by working with the APM group. I wish they had different letters than us, but anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, APM group carry professional indemnity for that and they helped us a great deal by um, causing us to develop a program which was developed to an international standard, not just what we thought was a good idea, but actually look at the standards, read the standards, and if it meets the standards, then uh, it should be an internationally acceptable and fair program, uh, which I think it is. Uh, and in the event that someone is certified, as competent and they turn out to be not competent, then by definition, by following the standards and the way we test, we've done what we can do to make that happen. The APMP is a little more lenient um, than some programs. For instance, we don't demand um, photo identity at the time of taking a foundation exam or anything like that. Um, but it's nonetheless a, a, a rigid standard that's been accepted internationally as being the appropriate standard for any program certifying people. Um, so we conceived, I conceived of that program, began to develop it uh, in 2004. I wrote the business case and took it to the APMP board um, who, well, they didn't say no. They didn't exactly say yes, but they didn't say no. So I took that as a green light and um, went ahead and self-funded, uh, developed the APMP program. Well, I say I developed it, I conceived it. Uh, without Kathy Day on the team, it would have never happened because I'm great at ideas and I'm very slow at doing. So it took the energy of someone like Kathy to get her head down for the best part of two years and actually write the 300 and whatever questions it was that are in the foundation database um, and the other associated documentation. But 
that's what led me to the board uh, once. So in 2000, well, just at the end, the last meeting of 2004 was where I presented the business case. And it, effectively, I volunteered to go on to the board for 2005. Um, and 2006, I was global CEO. And the interesting fact about that is that uh, there are chapters today that are bigger than the whole association was when I was the CEO. It's remarkable to see how the organization has grown um, in the last 14 or 15 years. Yes, Tony, 100%, my God. I mean, like the amount of time that, you know, volunteering and the other time that, you know, people like you, Kathy, and others have been building up the certification and related elements, you know, you can see the fruits that's now coming up, like as, as we grow across globally, that's something that people are looking upon as an industry standard and mentioned it is becoming a profession that people are actually choosing part of their career rather than you know jumping to something yeah absolutely when did you uh, when did you get your apmp certification tony <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> uh well i was in the first pilot group uh so actually a little bit of, i'll tell you the story about that in a second but very early on in the program um I, I, I actually took the APMP foundation exam paper-based and online because I was in the pilot group that tested both systems. Mm. Um, and there were a number of controls, again, driven by the standards and advice from APM group as to how we should pilot the whole thing, checking that people who we think should pass are able to pass and people who we think should fail are able to fail. And even to the level of asking some people at that stage to take the examination without doing any preparation to see if it, you could guess your way through it. Um, I always remember that the, the person that looked after Shipley's IT back in those days didn't know, even know what a bid was, but he was a good at IT. But we asked him to take the, to study the book and take the exam and he passed, wow. um, which was a good sign that you could absorb that knowledge he spent a lot of time studying the book, mind you. Um, but yes, I um, I took the exam twice, and uh, the, the agreement I've made with APM Group was if I took the exam, I wanted certificate number zero 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 one. <laughs> but they chose to give that to Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> because she took the exam be well no she didn't take the exam but she took her practitioner and her professional before me um uh kathy couldn't take the foundation exam because she'd written all the questions um but uh so i got zero 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 two but that's all right they're both in the same house now <laughs> yes so uh from then on, Tony, I mean, like the, the whole idea of certification come along and at some point it goes through the, um, the level from what for what practitioner was before to how the practitioner is now, Tony. How was the whole journey and at what point did we decide we need to update this? We need to take it to the online open version, Tony? Oh, almost as soon as we launched it, we knew we wanted to update it. There's been a number of interim refreshes of questions because the world of bids and proposals has evolved. Uh, so, if, example, if you go back to the original question set, there were very few questions or even possible to be asked about virtual proposal teams. Mm. How do they work? And now it's commonplace. The move to take practitioner from being an assessment to being an examination, the objective test examination, driven by a number of factors. Um, one of the contributory factors is that uh, if it's an assessment, the internationalization of it is limited. You have to end up with an assessor that can assess a German speaking submission, a Japanese speaking submission, you know, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Whereas the examination, theoretically, and it hasn't been translated yet, but theoretically, we're more capable of a translation. And I think the other big move that happened um, at the time we started the original program, uh, there was no APMP body of knowledge. Uh, the, there has to be for such a program 
a publicly available referenceable work so that the right answer is is written down in the public domain somewhere um, and the only public domain referenceable work at that time was the Shipley proposal guide um, very quickly Shipley handed over rights to its proposal guide to the APMP so that it could continue with the program and the APMP um, used that as its source uh, of here's the correct answers until uh, the body of knowledge was established by the team that was predominantly led by Charlie Devine. Mm. Um, and if I have a desire for the program, particularly with the new objective test examinations, which aren't just about reading the book and passing, the practitioner objective test is testing that you can practice, you're able to um, do more than just answer the question, know the facts. Um, is that it will cause people to look at and study the body of knowledge and want to contribute towards furthering the profession. That's my goal in the back of my mind. I'd like, I'd like the members of the APMP to recognize that they are as much uh, practitioners of best practice as anybody else. And if they think there's a better way of doing it than it says in the body of knowledge, then they should feel able and willing to share the way they do it. Not if it's some company secret, of course, but um, nonetheless, that's that's my great hope from the uh, next stages of the certification program. Thank you, Tony. That's a lot. I mean, like. Um that's a long journey that uh, you have gone through when from uh, you started to Shipley to APMP now to the certification now giving back uh, it's amazing Tony so round three now <laughs> yeah retire <laughs> <laughs>So Tony, it sounds like you've had an amazing career and you've contributed so much to the profession. Um, we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit and have some fun, lighthearted questions. Um, as a child, what did you want to do when you grew up? Oh, I don't know. Um, as a child, I think it evolves, doesn't it, depending on uh, your heroes. And um, I don't know, probably because of growing up in the proximity to Heathrow, I knew I wanted to travel um, and probably be a pilot. Um, but then I knew a bunch of people that were pilots and found out that their life wasn't as glorious as it seems. Mm. Um, so that, that was probably the most sustained. I, I was going to be an engineer because my uncle was a great physicist um and um no, it varies but yeah let's stick with it's going to be a pilot no oh, that's great and you were able to be a private pilot you mentioned right i was yes yeah, yeah. That's which great. doesn't have the same boring life as pilots yeah who are going back and forth from one place to another day you after the, day after day you got the best of both worlds there i think mm-hmm um, so it sounds like you travel a lot. What's the first thing you do when you get home from a trip? I'm very organized, unpack, um, mm -hmm. and get the washing on and get back into normal regime. Um, it's, um, I travel a lot less now, but I still, I still have duplicates of stuff. So I don't have to pack a, a wash bag to go away. I just take the traveling bag with me and that it's, it's there. Uh, and coming back is very much just about getting it back into that norm. Um, and, uh, being home, I, my worst year, and I call it my worst year, uh, was one, one member of my team calculated. I did 220 hotel nights in a year. Oh my gosh. Uh, that's a lot. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when you're at home, I'm sure you do some cooking. Is there anything that you cook better than anyone else? <laughs> um, 
I, I, again, I cook everything excellently. <laughs> um, no, I, Chinese. When I when I take the time and trouble to do the preparation, and um, I can do some nice Chinese dishes. Mm, that sounds delicious. So it sounds like you have many talents. What do you like most about yourself? <laughs> My sense of humor. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I think it's it's the um, there's a stubborn part of me. You know, I wasn't going to give up on certification just because everybody said no. Mm. Uh, I wasn't going to not set up an APMP chapter in the UK just because people didn't want to. Um, so I've got a stubborn element of me that's stubborn in a mostly good way, although I'm sure it comes out as bad way sometimes as well. But um, um, I like to try and find ways to get things done if I think they need doing. That's great. That's the kind of stubborn you want in someone. Mm. So it yeah. sounds like you've uh, come across some personalities that may have been challenging, especially with getting the certification um, moving and established. What type of person angers or frustrates you the most? Um, the people who... Uh, it comes a little bit from the not invented here syndrome. The people that won't support something because it wasn't their idea. Mm. And I meet these in all, not just the association or business, but clients in all, in all walks of life. You'll meet these people that um, some are just resistant to change. That's natural. But some people, if it wasn't their idea, nothing in the world is going to make it a good idea. And one of the human skills we all develop is learning how to make people think it was their idea in the first place. So they'll support it. Mm, so it's exciting. that type of personality that really frustrates me. And I guess it's, it's a different form of stubborn. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think we can all relate to that. Okay, last one. Um, do you have a favorite word? Philanthropic. Mm. Has a nice sound. <laughs> Philanthropic. <laughs> Um, yeah, and um, procrastination is almost as equal word. <laughs> <laughs> but very different meanings, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I got fascinated with procrastination when I was doing Latin at school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pro for crass tomorrow. You know. So, yeah. yeah. So they both begin with P. I've just realized that. Okay. So that's my favorite letter. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Tony, you mentioned philanthropic, Tony. I mean, like, who are the people who have been most influential in, in your life, Tony, and your career so far? Who, who are you more grateful for? Well, that's a big list. Um, Feel like I should get up on the stage like this. I'd like to thank my mother and my dad, my brother and my sisters. You know, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had a lot of people that have been good for me in many ways, and not that doesn't always mean nice. Um, people that have caused me to work harder to get what I achieve. Uh, that, in many ways, until you look back, you don't realise they were doing you a favour. I work for people who gave me opportunities. I was, um, because I could speak French, I was only a couple of years into working in my early 20s when EMI trusted me to um, get involved in the sales and contracts negotiation process for a contract in France. And that began my, uh, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, I guess, of... Um, traveling around the world for that organization, um, doing international and not being afraid of it. Um, I admire 
within the association, the people that have volunteered again and again and again to do things, um, those that have been willing to give up their time. Uh, it's not often thought about that uh, APMP has got where it's got on the back of volunteers. Yes, we've got a few very competent professionals in the organization today, beginning, of course, with Rick, uh, who's paid to do a job, but at the size of operation we are, we need that. Um, but everyone else is a volunteer, and it's a lot of time, energy, and effort to give up. And you've got to admire that in people. Um, so, yeah, I guess mostly. Um, it's people that you look at and think one day, or maybe look back at, rather than look at on the day and say thank you mm. and that includes of course your family my my wife um but people i've interacted with in all sorts of ways in my life mm. god it sounds very melancholic <laughs> didn't mean that <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole point i mean like we all stand on the shoulders of the people and most people don't give the shoulders and there's nobody can stand and do what we are doing. But I look upon you and it's, it's amazing. So thank you. What's the best? You're quite good yourself, Pascal. Don't knock yourself, mate. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice you have received and from whom, Tony? Oh. <laughs> probably from my dad mm. and it's a quote from someone I don't even know who if it ain't broke don't fix it mm. um, and yet as I said I, I like to cause change but that's not there's no point in fixing things just because you can mm. if it works leave it working um But yeah, uh, again, I've probably heard hundreds of good phrases over the years. I just can't think of any at the moment. Um, but there's a reason a lot of these adages creep into any language. Uh, it's because they're basic life's truisms. And uh, as the older you get, you start to realize, actually, the reason they say they're true is because they are true. So, Tony, what's the one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? Um, actually, it's hard work. <laughs> um, any career, you get out of it what you put into it. And if you put some hard work in, then you actually have a better career. So I talked earlier on, I was you know, traveling around Europe a bit more. I started to try and learn German and Spanish and Italian because I was going to those sorts of places. I never bothered with Greek, interestingly, but anyway. Um, <laughs> and it, when I tried to go to those countries and just tried to speak a bit of their language, it was a much better relationship. Um, and, it, and it's the same with work. Mm -hmm. If you put that bit of extra effort in to make it a bit better than it absolutely needs to be, it's probably worth it because you, you feel better about it. And so, yeah, beginning of my career, if someone said to me, the harder you work, the better you'll feel about your work life, um, that wouldn't have been a bad thing to hear. And again, it's true for all life. The more you put into a relationship, the more you get out of it. And work is just a relationship. That's such a great point. Um, that would be amazing advice to give to someone. Is there any other advice you would give someone to uh, who is wishing to pursue a career similar to yours? Um, I guess harking back to something I said earlier, you know, don't just complain. 
Mm. Go and do something about it. There's every aspect of your job. You know, if, if you don't like your job, get another one. If you don't like the way something's done, find a better way of doing it and cause others to believe that that's the right way and, and make it one of your little missions. Um, taking it one one bit at a time. It's, it, it's, I guess, get away from that victim mentality. Mm. My company doesn't treat me well. Well, your company isn't a person. It's people, and we all know how to behave with people. So do something about it. That's great advice. So it's clear you've had an amazing career and you've accomplished so much. You jokingly mentioned retirement, but what's really next for you? Um, well, by the, by the time this broadcast goes out, the uh, APMP will have launched the capture version of certification program. Uh, that's that's sort of next. The, the stuff that will happen around that. Um, and I think it's it's pet projects time, mm. and I don't know what those pet projects are. There's a there's a list. I find I find things that um, one of the reasons I like Microsoft Outlook, and I don't really like it, but you can put stuff on the task list in Outlook, and then you never have to do it. You don't have to look at it again. You don't have to click on that tab. So you just put it on the task list without a date on it. And there's a number of things on that list. Um, I'm not even going to look at it now to remind myself, but I know there's a number of things on that list which are pet projects. Um, some to do with work, some to do with uh, a charity that I support, uh, an organization called World Boring that um, puts water in schools in sub-Saharan Africa for, for the children. Um, those that's it's, it's pet it's pet project time if you can't get this far and then do your pet projects what can you do mm. and one of the joys of founding and owning your own company <laughs> <laughs> is uh you can decide when you want to retire when you want to take your pension or whatever but there's still some work to do yet still some uh things to do to help people in the profession um but I just don't exactly know what they are. Well, that's great. It sounds like some exciting things on your task list. Mm. I don't know because I'd put them on there just so I don't have to remember them. <laughs> <laughs> and it is really, there's a tip, you know, put it on a list and then forget it. And you probably find nothing happens because you have or haven't done it anyway. So. Um. Wow, Tony. Is there any questions, Tony, that that we could have asked, but we didn't ask you, Tony. <laughs> That's my favourite RFP question, Bhaskar. You didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually never um, asked. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've actually seen it in a document. It was in a in a UK document issued by, I believe it was the National Health Service. Okay. It said, are there any questions that we should have asked you that we didn't? If so, please tell us what the question is and give us your answer. And I was struggling for ages to think, how can I answer that and be non-compliant? Mm. I want to be non-compliant with the answer to that question. You know, you should have asked me this, and no, I, I'm not. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think I've enjoyed this uh, uh, little chat, and uh, it's been really good to share a few thoughts. And I'm confident that you can edit out some of the long pauses. No, Tony, and the errs. It's okay, Tony. We are not that, uh, we are not into anything and stuff. It'll be, it'll be fine, Tony. So thank you so much, Tony. Tony, thank you so much for your time. It's really You're welcome to have you with us at Scribble Talk. Wish you all the good health and happiness to do more and more for us. Please continue to inspire the Putin Proposal Industry colleagues, Tony. Thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome. And it's been really nice to talk to you both. So uh, I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Definitely, Tony. Definitely. We will. Thanks a lot, Tony. Thank you. To our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Please visit batchyscribble.com forward slash podcast to listen to this episode and check out any of our other previously recorded episodes. 
If you've enjoyed today's interview, don't forget to subscribe, review, and share the Scribble Talk podcast. We hope you'll check out our next episode where we interview another industry expert and special guest. Until then, it's Ashley Kays. Pascal Syndrome. Signing off. <laughs>